So we are back. Hello. For another week. Women's History Month still. Women's History Month. It is it is concluding. Yes, and I think um, we're concluding here, yes. And I think we're both talking about a topic today. Both of us could easily have been early American historians. I think I a little bit am. I a little bit. Yeah. I love a lot of the issues going on then. Um but we're doing women um the the I've titled it Women of the American Revolution. Mm. Yes. Uh I mean historians, we have to pick our words carefully because people try to read into it. Like, well, what do you mean? If I had said women in the American Revolution, it'd be like they're operating separately. Women during the revolution, oh, they're just over there doing something. Mm. May or may not be related, but it's like I like this. I like that you were so specific in your language. So women of the American Revolution. Of the American Revolution. We're going to dispel some myths today, I think, too. Yeah, I think that there's quite a few of them. And <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> and um, I can't believe it. We're in episode 37 right now. Episode 37. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are listened to now, I think, in 23 countries globally. Um, yeah, make sure you share. If you enjoy the podcast, share the information with your friends, like us, subscribe, post comments. Um, let us know you're out there. Let us know you're listening, appreciating what we're doing. Uh, we do not, we will not have a theme next month. So next month we'll go back to kind of our regular format of our various regular, topics. willy nilly, whatever we feel <laughs> like. Whatever no we want to talk about. Yeah. Um, but but this week, I think it's very focused. I think it's a good way to wrap up Women's History Month, too. I agree. Yeah. Even though we're going back a little bit, I think it kind of is a it's a little known topic and there's a lot of myths. So I think we're going to dive in. You're going to enjoy it. Welcome to An Incomplete History. I'm Hillary. And I'm Jeff. And we're your hosts for this weekly history podcast. So I'm going to have to hold someone in my lap today. <laughs> he's going to need the attention. I get it. Uh, yes, he's very, he's been very needy. Harvey's been very super needy lately. Um, he does not like me zooming or doing anything on the computer he's now. Taking away some attention that he may be getting. So Yes, that's true. Um, we've had beautiful weather, but it's supposed to rain this afternoon, which I'm a little disappointed by because I figured we had kind of moved beyond that, but, uh, you're having some weather. We're under a tornado warning. Um, I've Again. the alert to the whole family that if the alarm goes off on the phone, we all dive into the closet. So we've got some major weather going on here. I scoop up the cats and I bring the dogs. It's just, you know, whole family affair hanging out in the tornado shelter. So we do have that happening, but you know, I, I don't want to jinx it, but tornadoes don't typically come through Oxford, Mississippi. So although we can be under a watch or a warning and they are unpredictable, like we're usually okay. Yeah. When I was, I spent a couple of years in Kansas when I was in high school, oh, when, that's the tornado, yeah. when the top, when the sirens would go off, it just meant that there was a tornado that had touched down somewhere in the County. Right, but they're so unpredictable that it's like, well, it I might mean, it come be fifty over miles. Here, no way to know. Yeah, yeah. So, but let's. Um, we got a lot today, so let's jump into it because I think we're we're going to tear down some myths that people may be laboring under, but I think we're going to build up some new things for people to look at, some actual things that are grounded in reality as opposed to myth. So we want to. Do we want to tackle so? Women of the American Revolution, and I'd say there are a couple of points in history where this topic's come up. I, I would say the centennial, 1876, this becomes a topic of conversation, mm -hmm. and the bicentennial, again, 1976, and then kind of the end of the 20th century with kind of changes in women's history. 
Um, but do we want to start off with the most egregious myth? Go. Cool. Which one? All right. So Betsy Ross. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, Betsy. So if you've been to Philadelphia as a tourist, you have undoubtedly visited the Betsy Ross house. Uh, Betsy Ross is like buried now in front of her house. Um, you see it and Betsy Ross designed the American flag and George Washington went to her. And this was the kind of genteel way a woman was supposed to participate in the American Revolution. It's such a late 19th century characterization of women and it's complete balderdash. Why is it balderdash, Jeff? Uh, is because the first of all, why? First of all, well, I mean, it's it's made up by her descendants in the 1870s. It's just like completely created. So Betsy Ross, what do we know she actually does? She is actually a seamstress, and she does actually sew flags, first for the Pennsylvania Navy and then for the Continental Army and the United States. But she never designs these flags. These designs are carefully des- created and then she's just one of the people who's kind of making these things. Well, she's like a team of people who work for and with her too, right? I mean, that, right. that's a huge part of it. It's not like she's sitting there by the light of the fire all by herself, just sewing the American flag solo. Yeah. I mean, that's what we see. I mean, it's so so famously, she supposedly, according to the myth, and it's a myth because it's just not substantiated by anything in the historical record. Uh, Washington and a couple of people from the Continental Congress come to her and ask her to kind of make this new flag. And she looks at the designs and she says, okay, I'll do it, but let's change the stars from six pointed stars to five pointed stars because they'll be easier to cut out of the material and quicker to sew. First of all, if you've ever tried to cut a six pointed star out of paper versus a five pointed star out of paper, one of those is much easier to cut out and it's not the five pointed star. So this myth that they came up with isn't even believable. It's not even believable. And so it's, but the flag that she designs, which is the, with the 13 stars in a circle is known as the Betsy Ross flag. And it's a fun myth, but it's, I think it is insidious in a way. Well, it's a part of um, so much of mythology around American history and especially early American history is just like, We had nothing, you know, and it's like you want to for a sense of nationalism and national identity and unity, particularly amongst these like 13 colonies that have really not much in common. uh, You have to create this mythology uh, in order to get people on board with the story, with a a broader national narrative and story. And I'm thinking back to like, you know, the episode we did on Trump's commission. It's like. Just I'm sure they'd be attempt to do something like that over again. But, you know, it's not until the late, what is it in the early 19th century Bancroft comes around and goes, let's write a history of America, yeah. right. About the colonies and like, um, you know, this new country and like, you have to create all these stories and myths and stuff to get people feeling a sense of national pride. And mm-hmm. Betsy Ross is just one such myth. She is one, but I think it's insidious for us to continue to look at her and and think of her as this great kind of figure in the revolution. But do we think of her as like a great figure? Oh, yeah. I I think think people like know her name and I think people are aware of the myth, but I don't know how damaging it really is. Well, first of all, let me two things. Let me defend my assertion that people would think of her. So I think if you went out and just polled random people, they would list, if you were to say, give me the name of three women important in the American Revolution, I think Betsy Ross would always be mentioned. She might not be first, but she would always be mentioned. And the reason I think it's insidious is this, is she is presenting a very Victorian era, which is the mid and late 19th century and the very beginning of the 20th century. She's presenting a very Victorian idea of what a woman should do. So she is, how is she assisting the cause? She's sewing. So she's taking something that's already in the women's sphere of influence, what women are supposed to do. She's doing that. Does she have any political ideas? No. 
Is she coming up with like, is she volunteering to do this? No, she's being asked. So men are completely in charge. There is the one thing where she corrects, where she changes the way the stars look, but it's an aesthetic thing, right? And I think it's showing, look, this is the way a woman should participate in the American Revolution. And this is the kind of of political participation we want from women. And it's just, it's not true because there are women who are participating in ways that are very unlike Betsy Ross's. There are a lot of women, though, who are participating in the way that Betsy Ross is. And that's what, like, the homespun uh, right, but, phenomenon, uh, right? It's like they're in a way to protest British goods and to protest, you know, any sort of importation or consumption of British, British goods. Women do start to sew and women do make their own homemade clothing and they spin their own thread and et cetera, right? I mean, so like there is some truth to the fact that women are in the American Revolution as a form of protest and as a form of support for um, the revolution, they are doing these sorts of tasks like sewing. Um, But I think just the placing it all on this one person with the flag when there's no evidence of it, except for that her grandson told the story. Didn't Mm -hmm. they have affidavits signed Oh I yeah, I mean grand, after granddaughters and nieces and stuff, it's like, oh, I heard my grandma say this, and like, you know, there's something to be said. We can get into a whole discussion about oral history, et cetera, in some other time. But like, I don't understand the purpose of like creating this whole myth around this one person, and then well, it makes become... the family. It makes the family famous. It makes a family that didn't have any easy claims to like participation in the American Revolution. It suddenly makes that family very prominent. But I think I think you're right. I mean, I think the homespun movement is an interesting thing. And there's a couple of, of historical works I'm going to reference today. Um, so there's this amazing article that's written in My Mind is Escaping Me Now. I want to say it's the 1930s by Elizabeth Cometti, Women in the American Revolution. And one of the things she does is, first of all, that article um, – is so important because committees for the first time trying to look at the American Revolution and say, how did women participate in this thing? So notice she's not asking the question, did they participate? She's saying, how are they participating? What are they doing? So she talks a lot about the homespun movement. And I think that's a really, it's interesting, but it's also, I think, women's historians later in the 70s, 80s, and 90s really see Cometti's views as very constraining on women. But I think whenever you start to kind of write a history like this, you kind of have to start small and build out. And this homespun movement, I mean, what did women control in a colonial home? What what was kind of under a woman's control? Well, things like making clothing, making food, food. Um, helping provide for the children. Um, sometimes, you know, even cultivation of food and crops and such, right? Um, and there was a tradition of women being made kind of – when their husbands would have to be away, the wife would become like – she would take on the duties of the husband while the husband was away. That's how it, John Adams got to be successful was because Abigail took over the farm. And we'll talk about her, I'm sure. Yes. she's. She's pretty amazing. Um, But I mean, homespun and as well as uh, boycotting British imported foods and goods becomes a very outwardly obvious way for women to show their support of the, the cause. So if you showed up and you're wearing like a calico that was obviously imported from India, that's evidence you are not actually supporting the cause. Whereas if you showed up with something that's not very nice looking, <laughs> it, it was a badge of, of honor, right? You were like, right. nice support you made cause. that yourself. And like, that was the effort that you undertook to support a cause. But it's also, I mean, we've talked about this in past episodes about like, not everybody was in support of the revolution. And so it was a really good way to tell who was or wasn't in support, right? Based oh, yeah. on what they were wearing or what they were consuming Um, And women's economic buying power, I think, you know, we shouldn't 
I know that you're saying it's like, it's a place to start to talk about the homespun movement. And I think that that is important, but I think the most important aspect of it is just that women were flexing their buying power oh. here. I mean, they were exerting a form well, of this is, protest um, that I think is really important to give credit to. I mean, this is an argument a couple of women's historians make is that the upheaval of the revolutionary era is is actually what creates the conversation that later manifests in the middle of the 19th century and then leading into suffrage for women. The conflict is, is there in the revolution because once you upset kind of a society based on class and privilege and deference and condescension, I love to talk about condescension um, because it's, it's so different. These words mean so many different things in this era. So condescension in the revolutionary era means um, if you have like um, uh, somebody who's an elite who goes and talks, deigns to talk to a mere normal person walking on, that's called condescending. And people are really happy when it's done, right? They're um, – I'm thinking of the, the book, The Shoemaker, the Shoemaker and the Tea and Party, the party yeah. where he like, <laughs> where he's like, today, John Hancock condescended talk to talk to me. me. Yeah. He yeah. talked to me. And so it's not a bad thing. But if you think about it, human society for thousands of years up to this moment has really been strongly structured based on class, based on where you were socioeconomically, politically, et cetera in society. And the revolution is challenging that. And a lot of people get on board with it because they want to dismantle the whole thing. They want to obliterate those class distinctions entirely. And we know in the post-revolutionary period, this is a big thing that people are debating is, you know, how far did we mean to go with this? And, and unsurprisingly for most of the founding fathers, they didn't really want to go very far. No, because it doesn't benefit them really to have you to take those distinctions away. Right. I mean, they don't want women voting. They don't want, well, although there are errors or errors, omissions made in state constitutions that are later corrected to make sure women can't vote. But I mean, they don't want women voting. They don't really want women owning property unless there's no other way for them to own it. Um, I mean, women's rights are really curtailed. And, and this is where we get kind of something I'm sure we'll talk about at some point in the future, but we get this idea of Republican mothers and Republican wives um, where which is kind of repeating the Betsy Ross myth, right? In some way where it's like, or the ideals demonstrated in the myth where the place for women to influence society and politics is in the home domestically, the way they raise their children. Right. The whole purpose in life is to raise good future citizens. Right. And so, I mean, I think that that's so firmly rooted though. I mean, it's not just mythology because that is kind of the, that's the messaging at the time for white middle upper class women that that's what it they're is. supposed to be doing, but it's not the reality for so many women who live during this era, particularly oh, yeah. in rural areas, enslaved people, um, indigenous people, right? Like none of that applies to a huge portion of the population, right? Well, I mean, it's nobody, it's interesting as, as this recovery era of women's history gets kicked off by Cometti's article and then later on gets picked up again in the 70s. And we get amazing books um, like uh, Mary Beth Norton's Liberty's Daughters, Linda Kerber's Women of the Republic. As they start to kind of recover this history of women in the revolution, um, they there are omissions. Um they really are just talking about a very small percentage of the population. They're usually talking about elites. Well, because the that's most, the historical record left behind them. Because that's too, who right? leaves records. Yeah. Right. Well-behaved women seldom make history. 
Gosh, I hate that quote because it's used improperly all the time. So explain it. Explain explain the quote for our listeners because so it is a great quote. Yeah. So you see this quote all the time on like women's handbags or laptop cases or stickers or something. And I think what they think it means is like, be a bad girl because, you know, you might as well. It's like, that's not what the quote, <laughs> the quote is not. So the quote is from Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. It's well-behaved women seldom make history. And the idea is that only notorious people are the ones who are, you know, that you talk about or in the historical record. And it, it has nothing to do with, you know, you'll, you should be bad. It's like, this is a real shame that there's such a silence in the historical record for people who are just going and living their day to day lives. And it's actually so not- very difficult to uncover that. But she does. She writes this amazing monograph, A Midwife's Tale, where she does uncover the life of a just normal kind of woman going about her life as a midwife um, in the 18th century. And she uses this woman's diary, Martha Ballard. And, but in that, in that really deep research that she had to do and all this extrapolation from these diary entries that are so mundane, she just tells such a vivid story of 18th century womanhood, um, you know, life in the colonies for, for, you know, the middling sort of woman. Um, What she uncovers in all that though is like, look, this is really hard to tell these sorts of stories because there's just not a lot left behind about normal, average, everyday folks. So I, I find it funny that the quote is often taken to mean like, go be a bad girl, because it's that's just not it. So, I mean, I mean, it, this is an important thing to point out. So if you're just, if you are a, a farmer's wife in 1876, and you never end up in any kind of legal case um, or anything like that, very little is known about you. Yeah, because there's just not, unless you've written a diary like Martha Ballard did, right? The, what and What's usually known about you is like maybe a birth certificate. And it's not a certificate like we would have now, but like a, an entry in like a um, church registry. A church, a christening, right? a christening or something like something that. Something like that. You might have marriage, mar- marriage and death. And you might, And you might have something related to childbirth as well, right? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, you could end up in Martha Ballard's journal. Yeah, you could end up in Martha Ballard's journal. That's true. But it's just a very limited amount of information that's going to be available about you because there's just not a record left behind. And sometimes I think about the overabundance of records that we leave behind now, right? Where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm looking at grandma's Facebook page you know, from yeah. 2005 or something, right? Like you'll be, able, we'll be able to do that in the future. Um, but in that well, if period, we, if we save that stuff, you don't think that there's going to be some, I don't know. I, I think there's a conversation going on right now about people scrambling to save digital materials. Like digital for archives. Pages. I've heard of some. Yeah. Like because I mean, if, uh, so there's this great site called the Wayback machine and you can look at websites from certain point at certain points of time, even their stuff isn't complete. And I think we're going to lose a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, hopefully we won't, but uh, so I mean, we've got Betsy Ross and I think we've adequately dismantled her myth. Can we talk about my other mythological for person? Yeah, let's do it. Before we move into reality, Molly Pitcher. Oh, <laughs> Go, Molly Pitcher. That's that's what you learn about when you're really young. Yeah. Yeah. So Molly Pitcher, um, turns out Molly Pitcher is probably not one person. So what did Molly Pitcher famously do? Um, uh, at the Battle of Monmouth in June 1778, um, uh, it's either her husband or man manning a cannon And they fall during battle and she's been taking water to the men and she gets up there and she starts manning the cannon. And isn't that great? Um, Which is interesting because it's very different than Betsy Ross. 
I mean, this is act. She's actively firing artillery at British soldiers. Yeah, she takes this opportunity when there's a space for her, basically, and she goes and she's in battle. So, this no is evidence. a myth. No, evidence, this is a right. Right. But I mean, this is a myth that is grounded somewhat in reality. So there are a couple of potential people that Molly Pitcher may have actually been. Molly Pitcher is not actually the name of this person. It could have been this woman, Mary Ludwig Hayes. Um, her husband was an artillery man. It makes sense. Um, she was present at Valley Forge in the winter of 1777. She was her husband was present at the Battle of Manmouth, and Hayes, Mary Ledwig Hayes, would is what we would call a camp follower. There so were many a lot of, the, of women who were right. Many of the women and families of soldiers would follow the camps around, and this is it's both a source of comfort for the men, but it's also a real point of contention for men like George Washington trying to command these soldiers. Because they've got their families with them. Um, but uh, her husband um, gets injured. Uh, she mans the cannon. Um, and she's later given a commendation by George Washington. Um, and it does show up in at least one published memoir of life as a soldier in the war. So this is a this is a viable candidate for Molly Pitcher. But the other one that I think um, is probably even closer is Margaret Corbin. And a nickname for Margaret is Molly. Um, I mean, this is kind of interesting. This shows people how historians kind of do their work. Um, and she actually shows up in records. She was a camp follower as well. Her husband, John Corbin, um, was defending Fort Washington. That's... Um, in New York City, uh, he gets killed. She takes over the cannon. She gets wounded. Um, but in 1779, and we know this for a fact, this shows up in historical records, the state of Pennsylvania awards her an annual pension of $50 for her heroism in battle. So the state of Pennsylvania recognizes not only was she there, but she performed something they deemed heroic. And she is awarded this pension for the rest of her life. So she becomes the first woman in U.S. history to get a military pension. I think Margaret, I think she's Molly Pitcher. Well, so I think that it's the, what I like about the myth here is I think it's a conglomeration of stories yeah. that were told by lots of different people, in lots of different regiments, right? Where you did, you had women who would follow the camps you had families who would follow them all around um, and they weren't just sitting there. I mean, they worked, right? They were actively involved in day-to-day -day camp life and military life. And so I think that there probably were several instances of women joining in battle at some, in some way, shape or form. And so I think for me, the Molly Pitcher thing has always been like, this is a conglomerative story of lots of different women who may have done you know, different heroic acts at different points in battle. And so they just use this one woman to kind of exemplify, like, this is something that women did or were capable of. But the problem with that is that it does collapse it into one person. Mm -hmm. And we know that there were several women who were actively involved. Um, I mean, we know record-wise there are two women definitely who did something that meets the 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 definition. Now, sometimes Deborah Sampson is lumped into this. And I want to put her out as a separate thing because I think Deborah Sampson's doing something else. Um, Deborah Sampson actually disguises herself as a man to enlist in the Continental Army. Right. It's like the American um, Mulan story. Right. And she fights in the Revolutionary War. Um, and she actually um uh she actually successfully petitions um for a pension after the war even though she's already been discovered as having been a woman she is she is she petitions for this pension she gets it so she and corbin become the only two women to receive military pensions as a result of the war 
Would you but say gender was a little more fluid at that time? I well, so there are a couple of historians who've looked at this and talked about how it is not it is not our ni- late nineteenth and twentieth century. Uh, the ideas we developed during those times. Um, but she's, she's a fascinating person. Um, if you've never heard of a Deborah Sampson, you should read about her. Uh, I would say this, do not apply modern ideas about why she may or may not have done this to her. Take Deborah on her own ground. Um, the only way she could have enlisted in the Continental Army was if she disguised herself as a man. She would not have been allowed to enlist if she were a woman, if she presented as a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I somehow don't think she was maybe the only woman who did this. I mean, probably not. And I would say for a number of reasons, and one being just a huge shortage of, you know, people to fight. Um, you know, it's not like the Continental Army was just teaming with recruits and volunteers. And uh, it wouldn't be, to me, outside of the realm of possibility that there would be several women who were able to come and fill in and serve in these roles, particularly the women who had been following the camps around and had, you know, a pretty firsthand knowledge of the troop movement and what was happening and how things were going day to day. They had a certain grit about them. Um, it's not easy to, you know, follow these encampments around. And, you know, we all know about the tough winter at Valley Forge. Women were there for that. Children were there for that. Um, so the, the idea to me that women didn't participate except for these really few isolated incidents that we know of, I think that there's plenty of evidence to say that we know women participated in war on some level in a pretty broad way aspect. Now, do we know all of their names or do we know all of their actions? No, but just to know that they're present, they're not sitting there like bumps on the log, I guess is what I'll say. There's a job for everybody in these spaces. And so to assume that women were very active in these spaces, I don't think that that's completely off the beaten path. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it would, it would be very shocking for people to see how close women participate in the, the day-to-day operations of the Continental Army. Now, why isn't that talked about, though, except for these very few isolated figures? That's what troubles me, is that we don't have a more nuanced conversation about who and what and why we're participating in this conflict. Um, do you do you are you saying that a historian should look at how women are allowed to participate in and excluded from participation in the American military? That'd be an amazing project. That I will not undertake that. But well, I mean, it's a cha- It's one of the chapters of my work, right? That's an amazing project, Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, because it is contentious, and it's so contrary to our perceptions of that period. But also today, I mean, the, so we have a professionalized military today, um, and women are part of that, but the families of both men and women who are soldiers in the army and, and the other armed forces, they're, they are not officially part of that, right? I mean, they, they occupy this kind of nebulous space, and this is a debate that's never been fully resolved in the United States is what do we do with, how do we make of that? Other countries address it by only allowing single men to serve in the military. Um, Historically. I mean, they, the, the British army at one point in the British Navy as well, unless you were an officer, you were pretty much banned from participating if you were married. And so you have men who actually were married, who would fraudulently present themselves as single because Military commanders just didn't want to have to deal with with wives and children. In this situation, though, I like that you talked about how it's like professionalized. And as it becomes more professionalized, you do get these more stringent rules and these these binary kind of, you know, you're this or that and you can or can't participate based on these circumstances that are related to like marriage or family or, you know, sex, whatever. Um 
but at this moment in the American Revolution, I mean, it's kind of like the Wild West in a way, right? I mean, I I guess I shouldn't use that term, but it's kind of, I mean, it's a little more art. It's amateur hour. It is. <laughs> it is. I mean, I mean it, I mean, it is. They're it is. a really rough and tumble kind of group of people who banded together and like, they don't have a lot of organizational structure. They don't have a lot of discipline. They desert constantly. They're not being paid consistently. I mean, that's something we know that there were troops leaving left and right because they were starving. I mean, there's no infrastructure set up to supply these troops, to feed them. Um, and there's no there's no hierarchical structure really truly in place. And so, you know, if you join up to fight, it's like, come on, wife and kids, you're coming along. We're going to camp and we're going to fight. And you think about them up against like the most organized and robust military power at the time. And it's kind of a miracle that America becomes, you know, the United States it's becomes surprising. United States, huh? It is. It is surprising that Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, Hamilton, all of them don't end up strung up. It is. It is quite surprising. When we all uh, we know that's an economic thing, they just kind of wait them out. The British just can't afford to fight anymore. Plus, the British have an opportunity in India that is actually more lucrative and doesn't have the problems with English settlers in the colonies who may or may not try to make political claims. Right. Have ideas about entitlement toward representation or et cetera. Right? India, Britain's going to go in and rule a huge area with people of color who they will deny any claims to particip participation politically. It solves the problem. I mean, it's, it's, um, but, but let's turn back to these women and let's move now. I know you have some women, so let's move now from kind of dispelling or clarifying some myths to, to some of the kind of, uh, monumental figures in the American revolution. Well, there is, there is like a little bit of a, a myth here situation where, you know, I want to talk a little bit about Paul Revere and the myths surrounding him. And women. he looked like Jack, he, you know, he looked like Jack Black. Oh yeah. So if you look for, or if you look at portraits of Paul Revere that were painted during his life, they look like Jack Black. I always show one to my students and I ask them, although incoming freshmen now don't really know who Jack Black is as much, but yeah, Jack Black if you if you ever listen to this or somebody who knows him listens to it, you need to star in a biopic of Paul Revere because you are the spitting image of him. Maybe Jack Black listens. Maybe we'll um, maybe we'll just labor under that myth. Okay. Um, well, so the idea is that like Paul Revere is responsible for like warning the British are coming. The British are coming, right? Like this isn't which is you learn really young, and which is so silly, right? But. There were women who were warning, you know. But they weren't saying the British are coming because that would have been like, right? Well, yeah, we're all here. We're, we're all, all yeah, British. We're all British. Yeah. The redcoats are coming. Yeah, but that, but that's what you hear that he says, right? Like that's the mythology you're surrounding it. Is that what? That's what he yells out. The British are coming. So we're all British. Um, no, but. There were women who were involved in being early warning or siren kind of systems to different colonial um, establishments to warn and to spy and to track troop movement. Um, and one woman I'm thinking of in particular is Sybil Lettington. Um, and, you know, they'll talk about her as, oh, she's the female Paul Revere because um, she rides through Putnam and Dutchess counties to warn that the militia of British troops were burning down Danbury, Connecticut. And so she sees this happening and she goes forth and she just starts warning everybody in towns along the way. And what I think is interesting about it is that, you know, to, again, to collectively mythologize that one person warned because one time this happened is so interesting to me because we kind of like hang our hats on that and call it a day. Like, oh, you know, there was all peace. And then all of a sudden, there was an attack and one person warned about it. And that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just kind of weird to boil it down to something so simplistic. I think it's easier. I think it's easier for people to 
But it's silly. It is. Yeah. So Sybil Luddington, I think, is a good example of another a woman who's actively participating and has taken a side. Because I do want to emphasize again, there were a lot of people who were living in these regions at this time who were pretty apathetic. You know, they they didn't really, you know, a lot of people were just Tories. They just stayed on the side of the British and said, like, what are these nutcases doing here? You know, what is independence? What are you talking about? That was a portion of people. But the far greater percentage of people were just apathetic toward it. They didn't they weren't involved. So when you have women like Sybil Luddington who takes a, a decided stance and is, you know, kind of spying in a way to try to figure out troop movement and what's happening and if there's an attack and then goes out of her way to go and warn people, um, why don't we talk about her? Why do we talk about Paul Revere instead? You know, did he do a better job of it or because he looked like Jack Black? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. Why do we talk about the figures we talk about in the American Revolution? I think it is, it's myth making, right? It's it is creating this national, as you said earlier, it's creating this national origin story, and certain figures drop out. I mean, no, so so far we're you know forty minutes into this, we have not mentioned a single woman of color, um, because the story for many black women in this time is that the British offer freedom and the United States or the colonies do not. So you get these women who move from American controlled areas to British controlled areas to get freedom. And in fact, we know this happens in New York as they're evacuating loyalists out of New York. You get former slaves well, I will say there's one woman of color who's on my list to talk about, and that's Phyllis Wheatley. Yes. Is she on your list? She is on my list. Go ahead and, and yeah. let's talk so about Phyllis Wheatley. She supported the Patriots during the American Revolution, but she also actively was writing against and, you know, um, saying, you know, that slavery is wrong and it's immoral and it should stop. And she wrote several letters to... Um, leading figures of the day um, on she has her own treatise on liberty and freedom. Um, and she's a poet. She's a poet who lives in the 18th century. Um, she was born in the mid 18th century and she died pretty young. Um, she was, I think about 30 years old. She lived 1753 to 1784. Um, she spent much of her life enslaved, uh, but she was the first African-American and second woman ever to publish a book of poems. And so she is alive and uh, a witness to the revolution dying in 1784, right? She was very much alive and witness to it. And um, she is, I think, a, a huge literary figure in the late 18th century. And I try to include some of her poetry and stuff when I teach classes on the early republic. Um, but she's a unique figure, too, because she was educated. Um, she arrives in American in America. I mean, she was taken. She was kidnapped from Gambia, Africa in 17, um, excuse me, in 1761. Um, but in her during her arrival, she could read the Bible. She could read Greek. She could read Latin. She could read British literature. Um, she studied astronomy. She studied geography. And she started writing and publishing poems as a, as a teenager. And so she lives a very short life, but she's a prolific writer and an intellectual and a very much um, a contemporary of the American Revolution. So I don't think we talk about Phyllis Wheatley. I never read about her or talked about her in the standard like K-12, this is American history. Did you? No, definitely not. But she's a towering literary figure at that time, right? Maybe. I mean, she's definitely doing stuff. And, and I think she's operating in parallel fashion to some other women who we actually do talk about a little bit. I mean, remember, when I was in K through 12, we just didn't talk about women in the American Revolution. 
It just wasn't talk about women if, in general, probably. Right. But if we did, it was Betsy Ross, mm-hmm. Molly Pitcher, mm-hmm. Martha Washington, maybe a little Abigail Adams. Um, uh, John, remember the women. Remember the ladies. Remember the ladies. We got to talk about her. Yeah. Let's talk about Abigail Adams. Okay. She's, I, we did talk about Abigail Adams when I was growing up, I think, but we didn't really talk about how truly fierce of a person she was, how fierce of a woman she was. I mean, she was, I think, BFF with her husband, which is so unusual at this time. He respects her opinion. He asks her opinion. He appoints her as, you know, in charge of his affairs back home while he's, you know, being this politician, right? Um, And we have, what I like about talking about her is we have extensive letters that go back and forth between Abigail and John. And when you read those, you can really kind of see that there's a genuine respect between the two. And he doesn't just talk, I mean, he actually writes to her and asks her about her opinion on politics. She writes back to him and tells her, she tells him what she thinks. And, you know, at one point you have that famous quote where she says, remember the ladies, and then they, they forget them. But there is this, There is this intellectual exchange that happens between Abigail and John that I think is very uncharacteristic of the time period. At the same time, though. However, that being said. At the same time, John does ultimately have almost complete control over Abigail. Well, legally. Yes. Well, absolutely. Because every man had control over his wife legally all the way up into the 20th century. Um. Yeah. So, uh, I don't. Have you seen the HBO John Adams series? I saw it a long time ago. Yeah. I. It's great. It is. I think I everybody should. It. I think that I love Laura John- Lenny plays Abigail Adams yeah. in it. There's a great scene when she's getting smallpox vaccine. That's right. That's right. Um, I also I do show a scene from it when I teach freshman uh, U.S. history. Because there's a great depiction of tarring and feathering, and it actually shows how horrific tarring and feathering was. But, I mean, she's a fascinating person. Um, I don't think she holds a candle to my favorite woman in the American Revolution. Who's your favorite woman in the American Revolution? Mercy Otis Warren. Oh, she's on my list, too. Well, I think you can make an argument that she does more than almost anyone else to shape what this revolution is going to look like. She's a prolific writer. Yeah. She is a poet. She is a writer. She's a polyglot like Phyllis Wheatley. She learns a lot of different things. She has varied interest. She's very much a product of the enlightenment, but she carries on correspondence with Sam Adams, John Hancock, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, Washington, particularly uh, John Adams. Yeah, so she's not just talking to like her husband. She's actually writing to all these different men and giving off her political stance and opinion, which I think is really neat. And we have extensive evidence of that too, which is nice. And I mean, it's and she is really influencing the the revolutionary direction these men are taking. And um she's also interested in history. Um she's obsessed later in her life she becomes obsessed with the history of Rome. Um, and, uh, in 1805, she publishes this, one of the earliest histories of the American revolution. It's called history of the rise, progress, and termination of the American revolution. And she is just this, you cannot overstate her influence on the ideology of the American revolution. She is a diehard supporter of breaking with Britain. Um, she is a defender of what she calls colonial rights and liberties. She talks about how the British government is consistently infringing on this. Uh, her husband, James Warren, is also really prominent in the independence movement. Um, but she writes um, uh, a pamphlet even after the revolution um, and signs it a Colombian patriot. Uh, and she wants a bill of rights included in the constitution. She says, you have to include this. Um, what's so sad though, is like, she makes all these compelling claims just alongside Abigail Adams and they're just ignored. 
it's Hopefully true. It I mean, I think, I, I think, bad. I mean, I, I think Warren though, she is with the exception of, with the inclusion, not the exception, with the inclusion of Jefferson and maybe Madison, because I think what Madison actually does in the wake of the revolution is brilliant the way he actually figures out a way to make this thing work together. But I think with the exception of, or the inclusion of those two, I think she's one of the most intellectually prominent figures in this whole movement. Yeah. And again, you have this written record, knowing her stance, knowing, you know, with whom she was in correspondence, which is really exciting. Um, And you can really just nail down who this person was or what she believed. Um, She was on my list for that same reason of just she's a she's an intellectual giant at that moment. And she is in communication with so many of these prominent figures. But it's a name that we don't hear. Once again, I never heard her name. When I well, was she, cool. So she writes this play. She's also a playwright. So she writes this play in 1773 called The Adulator. And it's satire. It is a satirical treatment of uh, Thomas Hutchinson, who's the governor of Massachusetts, who was hated by all of these people. Adams, uh, both John and Abigail Adams, Hancock, Sam Adams, all of them hate this guy. Um, and... She includes characters like Brutus, um, and Brutus is uh, is like her her brother repackaged as a character in the play. Um, but the main character Rapatio um, is just a horrible person, and uh, the play is so popular and so well known that people start calling Hutchinson Rapatio. They start using the title he was given in this play, this satirical play, on him. And she's just brilliant. I mean, she's such an enlightenment figure. She's able to engage in kind of entertainment via kind of plays and poems, but she also engages in philosophical questions. Um, And then she's writing these political pieces. And... um, but she gets criticized by some other women. Because she's too outward outspoken or right. I mean, well, I mean, I think, I think Abigail Adams is one of the critics at one point that, that she sees Warren as maybe overstepping the bounds of what a woman should and shouldn't do. Um, that, um, you know, Abigail Adams, her status as a woman was part of what legitimized what she was saying. And I think there was the fear that somebody like Warren, um, as she pushed out of areas that were kind of places women could and were permitted to kind of talk, it became unseemly to some other women. Um, But... And also sort of presumptuous for her to be contacting all of these men, perhaps. I think that's very presumptuous. I think that was very much viewed as, well, she and her husband, though, were so, they were kind of like, um, they were like hippies of the revolution or something. I mean, it's, they were very much different than all of their compatriots. Um, so I like the discussion about like the intellectual contributions of women But I kind of want to shift gears a little bit to talk about these women who were actively involved in kind of combat situations, spying situations, um, where they, you know, they were day to day, their life was impacted by the war. And I'm thinking about the frontier. And I'm thinking about my favorite revolutionary woman of the American Revolution is Nancy Hart. I don't know if she made your list. But no, I think I cut off. I don't remember my exact reason for not including her. Um, Obviously, once I had Warren positioned where I wanted to talk about her, everybody else kind of pales in comparison. But 
Are you serious? Okay. <laughs> let me convince make, me. Let me make convince an argument me. for Nancy Hart. Okay. So she's a frontiers woman. And I, when you say frontier, we're talking about like Georgia. Georgia was considered the frontier during this time period. And she's kind of this legendary figure of the American Revolution. And she would go around making it her mission to rid the area of all British loyalists and Tories. She was a spy. Um, she would infiltrate British regiments and troops by disguising herself as a man. And she would kind of stumble into their uh, encampments and act like she was kind of feeble minded is what they would say. Um, and just kind of like, what's going on? What are you guys doing here? You know, and just ask a bunch of questions. And then she would take that information, that intel and bring it to other kind of like guerrilla troops, right? Not, it's not necessarily the Continental Army per se, but like there's other forces that are trying to like get the Tories out. Um, and so she's a spy and there's this really big folklore story that surrounds her. And there's some, there's evidence for it. Um, you know, there's a bunch of encyclopedia entries and there's some, um, you know, there's some narratives of the American Revolutionary War. I would like to dive into this more at some point, just on my own, because I was so fascinated by this story. But there's a story about her where her husband is away and she's managing the farm. She gets snuck up on by uh, several British troops, I think maybe like seven or eight men. Um, and they stop by her house. They know that she has been keeping an eye on the troops. They've kind of figured her out at this point as this patriotic woman. Um, and so they come into her house. They demand that she cooks them her best turkey. They make her kill her best turkey. And then they start saying, you know, you need to feed us and entertain us or whatever. So she has them in her house. They pile up all of their guns at the corner of the cabin that she's in and they're getting drunk and they're eating and she's feeding them. She sends her daughter out and says, go get some water and tells her secretly, get the conch shell and alert other townspeople or people who are around that the British are here. So secretly while they're drunk, she's pushing their muskets and their, you know, all their weapons out the side of the cabin they figure out what she's doing about halfway through and she holds him at gunpoint and says, if you come near me, I'm going to kill you. She ends up killing one. The other townsfolk come and one of them being her husband comes back and they hold them up hostage and she ends up overseeing them all being hung. And so they actually uncovered the grave of these soldiers. I think there were six skeletons that they found um, to kind of corroborate this bit of Georgia folklore or um, mythology, but there's, I think that her story is one where it's like, she's really living it, you know, like day in and day out, her life is actually impacted by this conflict. She's not only impacted by it, but she takes a stance, she takes a side and she stands up for her cause and she's, she's violent She's sneaky. Um, she has plans. Like she has these contingency plans where she's like hidden this conch shell out. Her daughter's involved in it. There's another story where the British were like spying into their cabin and her daughter um, threw boiling water on them and like scalded their faces or something like that. So like, I love her story because she's not like this towering intellectual or something, but she's just to me, like when you talk about it's hard to uncover just normal everyday people's experiences. I love her story because she's just somebody who day in and day out is living through this conflict and participating in it. So for me, it's Nancy Hart. It's a good case. <laughs> it's a, I mean, I think it's interesting because I think Nancy Hart and Mercy Otis Warren are kind of at, at polar are polar opposites in many ways. Yeah. Right? But so in both um, so important, right? Right. Well, that's this has been great. Um, I know we have more people we could talk about. Yeah, my list but, is a little out of control today. But I had to get um, Nancy in because I thought she was just no, so I think cool. she's fantastic. She's fan. Has anybody written like a, a researched monograph on her? No. I so that's why I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to look into this more. Like I said, there's some encyclopedia entries on her. 
Um, she is mentioned in, let me check the source that I was looking at. She's mentioned in um, an edited volume on revolutionary women in the war for the American independence, which was uh, published in 1998, uh, just an edited volume. So I'm going to go look at that source, like, and look through all the different chapters and see if there's something a little more specific, but she is such a cool figure that I'd love to dive a little deeper into. Oh, there's another one, uh, Patriots and Petticoats, Heroines of the American Revolution. And that's a children's book from 2004. And that makes me happy that she appears in this children's book. I want to know how they how they frame her shooting a British soldier and then overseeing the hanging of the, the other ones in a children's book, though. I am maybe going to purchase it and get back to you. I think this is the type of book I would like the children to read. <laughs> Well, this has been fun. I think this is a good way to wrap up Women's History Month. Yeah, it was fun. It was a good one. Awesome. Well, I don't know what we're going to do next week yet. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. Uh, thank you it'll for joining us. It'll be exciting. All right. Well, until next time, I'm Jeff. And I'm Hillary. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.